Fellowship. It is my great joy to welcome you. We are celebrating our 50th year, and we are so glad you're here. Through thick and thin, ice, rain, and snow, everybody has made it, including the 71 works of art that are just waiting for you to see. There are so many people to find. And first of all, I would like to ask all the artists who entered this exhibition <coughs> to please stand. I cannot begin to tell you how 
how thrilled we were when Herb Jackson agreed to be the juror for our artist exhibition, the 50th this year. And let me tell you, my friends, this was not by accident. In 1964, it was suggested that some of the docents at the North Carolina Museum of Art and the staff of Olivia Rainey Lyle <coughs> have a one-man show. And a young teenager in Raleigh by the name of Herb Jackson was selected as the featured artist. The show was such a success and the acknowledgement that more was needed in our city of Raleigh to promote the arts that soon after that, the Raleigh Fine Arts Society was born. In one sense, you might say, her, you were our founding father at a very young age. <laughs> Herb's illustrious career is one that we all salute and that we could talk about a very long time. And I know you can hardly wait to hear from him, so I will be brief. Herb is a retired professor of art at Davidson College and a former chair of the art department there. He has had one-person exhibitions in the United States, Peru, Portugal, and Canada. His work is in more than 100 museum collections. And he was selected to be included in the first exhibition of contemporary American art presented in the Soviet Union in 1989. In 1999, Herb received the North Carolina Award, the highest civilian honor bestowed on a citizen in our great state. And just recently, we have learned that he is the one 2015 recipient at a celebration to take place in May of the North Carolina Society Award, noting his long and distinguished service in the enhancement, promotion, and preservation of North Carolina. It is with great joy, appreciation, and sincere gratitude that we welcome Herb Jackson, our 2015 Artist Exhibition Journal. And so he did, and I said, well, 
how's anyone going to know about it? And he said, let me take care of that. It turns out that Jimmy Team was a natural promoter. He had promoted Andy Griffith, Ava Gardner, and numerous others. He was active in the Raleigh Little Theater. And he sent out press releases and called in all sorts of favors. And we had a tremendous response. The show was up for one week. We had 2,700 people. And because I couldn't sit there all day, but somebody had to. A group of friendly women were solicited to take turns sitting there. <laughs> Partly to guard the art, but I wasn't worried anyone was going to steal the art. But we had also the entire collection of art books from the Living Room Library out on display as part of the event. And so these women would help sit the table. And that's how I, I later learned a year ago that the Raleigh Fine Arts Society was formed. So I'm extremely honored to be asked back. And <coughs> my Marco Rubio moment here. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about jury shows. I believe in them. In fact, I used to run the largest print drawing show in the United States called the Davidson National Print and Drawing Competition. And we would have 3,000 entries, one per artist, that came from all over the United States. The value of it for the artist is a chance, a democratic chance to have your work seen. Entering a jury show is not about hoping to win, because that's a long shot. But if you can get your work seen by a curator or critic or another artist, depending on who's jury, your work may be used later in another project. So it's very important to know sort of who's looking at your work and what they might be able to do with it. In addition, you get a chance for the general public to see it if you are accepted. Now, jurying from the viewpoint of an artist, I'm very much aware that if you're not accepted, it's a form of criticism. And it can sting to get a rejection notice in the mail. So I'm very sensitive to that. And when I was jurying, I was somewhat concerned by the fact that I wasn't seeing your actual work. Now I'm speaking to the artist directly. I was seeing a digital image of your work. And in many cases, that may have colored my response. I tried the very best I could to get around that. But nevertheless, if I didn't put you in, I want you to think about it this way. The nature of criticism in my mind can be accepted based on who gives it. Or as the Dalai Lama says, right action produces right, or excuse me, right action derives from right motive. So if someone is giving you criticism because they want to help you, or in some way further your efforts, there's no real reason to be defensive about it one, one way or the other. My recommendation is simply to let it pass through you, not necessarily reject or accept any kind of criticism at first, but just think about it. And if it becomes a consistent response, say you enter a jury show every six months and you keep getting rejected, there may be something to learn from that. In any case, you don't want criticism to discourage you. As Giancarlo Minotti said, many a critic has ruined my breakfast. No critic has ever spoiled my lunch. <laughs> now let me tell you a little story about myself related to criticism. In 1962, I had the opportunity to spend the summer in Chautauqua, New York. And on the way, I stopped in New York City and spent a lovely week with my brother-in-law's parents. His father was a lawyer, but an amateur painter in the, in the greatest sense of the word. He was absolutely passionate about his painting, and he was quite good. He taught me, we would go during the day to the museums, of course, in New York City, but at night he would teach me what he was doing uh, 
in his studio. And he worked with a pellet knife. And he did these very impressive cityscapes of New York. The buildings, the tugboats, the water, the sky, <coughs> everything. So being young and impressionable, I tried to internalize everything he was doing and figure out how I could do it as well. When I got to Chautauqua, I entered into an art program with a painter named Revington Arthur, very eccentric New York painter, but in my eyes, particularly at that age, very important. He had had maybe 20 shows in New York City. He had studied with Gorky. It was my first real introduction to a professional <coughs> artist. So I thought I'm really going to impress him. Our class, our group, was mostly middle-aged women, which was very pleasant as far as I was concerned. And during the first week, all Rivington Arthur said to us one day, one moment, was make a painting. And he left. So all week long I worked on this cityscape in New York. I thought, I'll show them. Well, the women kept doing an eye over it, who would buy it, who wanted it, and all this. I was, I was very happy. I was having my desired result. He walked in for the critique. He goes easel to easel, he gets to mine. He said, that painting is awful. And I'm thinking, what? And all my middle-aged women friends are standing around going, what? <laughs> so, I wasn't quite ready to take my own advice. I was pretty defensive, but I had nothing to say. I just was boiling inside. So I stayed up all night and started painting a new painting. He came in a week later. He gets to my easel and he says, who painted that? I said, I did. He said, no, you didn't. I said, oh, yes, I did. And he said, now you're starting to paint. Well, that's the painting that later won the North Carolina Annual and began to give me the confidence that maybe I could be truly an artist. And so, what I would say I learned from that was that you basically have to find your own work. Oscar Wilde said, true art only begins where imitation ends. And the reason why that's so important is when you are making an image, and you're using marks, color combinations, forms that derive from somebody else. You don't know the problems that they generated to get there. All you know is the surface solution. And so what you begin to do is create something lifeless without integrity. And the danger is that you'll lose what it could be that's yours. Of course, Picasso said we're all thieves, but you have to put it through your own filter. And so I would say, uh, by way of commenting on what I noticed during the jury process, is there is a fair amount of derivative work out there. And I would hope, uh, if this applies to you in any way, you would take it to heart and begin to explore your own problems, visual problems. Now, the way I jury is related to that comment in the sense that I'm looking for something personal. Don't really come into it thinking, I want to see something original, because that isn't the point. If it's personal, it will have a uniqueness because there's only one you. <coughs> it's something that Tapias would call the power of presence. And it's your integrity that's infused into the work, and that's what I'm looking for, whether I particularly like the work or not. And I think that's important to understand because as a juror, I find it unfair to only exercise my own taste, but rather to acknowledge when someone is doing something well done and personal, it just doesn't happen to appeal to me on a personal level. Some of the things that I noticed as I juried, I would like to 
discuss, and this is directed mostly to the artists here, but for those of you who aren't artists, it might give you a little insight into how I think when I'm jury. The first thing is the reliance on narrative. And what I mean by that is sometimes, particularly with issues of humor, you can become seduced by your own cleverness, thinking that this is so amusing or so quirky that it's going to be profound. Now my guess is that will sustain you for about 30 seconds with your viewer. Because by the time we get past the teenage years, there's almost nothing about adult existence that we haven't been introduced to. Birth, death, sex, love, war. And so the profundity of your painting is not going to come from the narrative. It's going to come from what I was referring to before, the power of presence. When you come into that, the, the aura of that work, you sense that, that power is there. And the narrative is not what carries it. If you'll think about something like the Madonna and Child, it's the narrative that people from the Judeo-Christian background know. There are Madonna and Childs in the basements of museums all over the world. Why are they there? compared to the Raphael that's upstairs. It has nothing to do with the story whatsoever. And if you go out to the North Carolina Museum, which was my haunt growing up, and we go every time we're here in town, including today, and let's say you go into the tribal art area, there is no way, even if you study it intellectually, that you could really know or internalize the tradition of the narrative behind those pieces. But, Standing in front of one, you sense, again, this immense power that's infused into it. And that's ultimately what I think any artist ought to be trying to shoot for in their own work. Now, sometimes in an effort to come up with a convincing narrative, people will work from photographs. And I want to be very careful here to distinguish between photography as an art and using photographs as a subject of your painting or drawing. <clears throat> Why is that a problem? Well, I think photography in the 20th and 21st century is some of the most profound art form we have. And I put a number of photographs in this situation. <coughs> but there were a number of pieces of people's drawings and paintings based on photographs but I did not put in. A camera is based on monocular vision. And so when you look at a subject, it's already flat and abstract from a camera. When you try to translate that into a painting or a drawing, often it goes completely cold. And I often found this in my younger years when I would, in college, I would do a lot of dueling in the notebooks and uh, not paying attention to the lecture, probably. And I would try to translate one of those into a painting, and inevitably it died midway because the spontaneity and the, the action that I had created in my original doodle or drawing died as I tried to translate it, blow it up, whatever, in a painting. And the same thing can often happen when you work from a photograph. So I would encourage those of you who are using photographic information to research, look at your photograph. Say you're painting an elephant. Well, you don't have an elephant in your studio. Look at your photograph, then put it away and paint what you saw. Don't try to directly transcribe it one to one. Scale is another issue, and this was a problem with using digital imagery. Once I saw your actual work yesterday, I realized, excuse me, that some of your pieces would be much better had they been larger, and some could well have been much smaller. And so when you choose your scale, I want you to at least be mindful about why you're choosing it. Don't just grab a canvas or a piece of paper and say, okay, that's the next one up. You want to adjust your 
your image, your mark making, everything you do to the scale of what you are doing. And then as you move along and need to change your mind, react to that scale. Now I'm not going to go to the reception afterwards and tell you which ones I think are too big or too small. <laughs> but I do think it's a mindfulness you need to develop so that, for example, the misconception that if it's big it will be better or more important uh, can be put to rest. <coughs> color is another issue that concerns me because color has an integrity of its own, quite apart from any kind of formal color theory. Color is something just as personal as your mark making, uh, the images that you develop, and often what I notice is that artists will use what I call corporate color. What I mean by that is instead of nuancing the color, the thought is, well, I need red here, so there's a tube of red, and I'll just use that. And when you do that, you let the corporation manufacture that pigment determine what that red does in your painting. Whereas if you think about, okay, what do I want red to do for me in this painting, and start to nuance it one way or the other by addition to other pigments, you can develop your own personal color sense. And I noticed when I was jurying that that was often a problem. You've done all these things that I talk about, and now you have to sign them. I cannot tell you how many pieces that I saw in the digital images that I couldn't put in the show because they were ruined by signatures. A signature is a great deal more than documentation. It's also part of your composition. And if you will go out to the North Carolina Museum, as I did as a young person, and look at each painting and thinking, purely composition, how does this work? Why is it in a museum? What is going on? You will see that generally if there is a signature, it's very quiet somewhere. It's maybe scratched into the paint surface or it's in a very close value paint to what it's going over. And unfortunately, as we come along as artists, we think, oh, signature, that's the most important thing to get my name on this. I assure you that in addition to being disruptive to the composition most of the time, it is absolutely unnecessary. You can sign your work on the back. The purpose of the signature is obviously to document for the future, for your heirs, your children, your relatives, and perhaps for someone who purchases the work in the future. It's completely legitimate on the back. And so I would encourage you to think very carefully. If you are going to sign it on the front, try to make it compositionally important but very neutral. And finally, after you've done all of this, there's the issue of presentation. One of the advantages that some of you had when I only saw your digital images, I didn't see your frames or I didn't see your colored mats. I just saw the image. This was very kind of the administrators to do this for you. <laughs> because there are a number of pieces that you will see in a, in a few minutes that are disadvantaged by the way they're framed or the way they are matted. And I would simply say this. Think carefully again about the issue of neutrality. If you put hours hours of emotion and effort into something. Why do you need something else? Sometimes you'll hear a framer say, well, let's, let's change this mat and bring out the green and the bees. I think that's incredibly offensive. <laughs> if I wanted to bring out the green and the bees, I would have put more green. I don't need a mat to do it. <laughs> and if you think about museums as institutions which make every effort the art to the art's advantage. You will never see colored mats. You rarely will see frames made out of barn slats and, and on and on. So my hope is that you won't get to the end of your
process and then queued it up with a presentation because it's better than that. And there are many pieces down there that if I could just take the frame off, they, they would really shine. I'll just close with another uh, Oscar Wilde quote, which is, just be yourself, everybody else is taking. thought it was really interesting what you said about narrative versus power and presence and I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that why you know how that happens for you and, and why you think that's important uh, sure I'll try to do that but when you say how it happens for me you mean when I'm looking at someone else's artwork you know it, it happens by the very nature of being in the presence of that artwork and I would go back to what I said about the tribal art. I can't possibly know the traditions from which that comes. And yet, if you make a comparison between a piece that has a true background infused in it, both by tradition, 
tradition and also by the skill of the artist versus something made for the trade. With a lot of African art, for example, right now, you can see made for the trade and artificially aged, etc., etc. You can tell, but you don't necessarily know. In fact, you would probably never know the true spiritual significance behind that work. Um, and I feel like it's the same way with, a, say, an abstract painting like Rothko. When you're in the, in the presence of one that really works, and they don't, in my opinion, they don't all work, but when you're in the presence of one that really does, it is ineffable. It's there. And there's not a narrative that you read about. It's simply something which, again, Tapia's calls the power of presence. And so, I remember Glenn Greenberg used to say that we heard you can always talk about something you don't like. But if you really respond to something, how can you possibly put it into words? It's like trying to explain to someone why you love the person you love. It's all of the different factors coming together. And with a strong piece of art, for me, it's the same way. But what I caution against is having an idea, an intellectual idea, oh, this is clever, or this is profound, this is going to save the world. And you've only got, I mean, we know for a fact that in museums, people, if they give you 60 seconds, you're lucky. So that narrative is not going to be what keeps the person coming back to your painting day after day. Does that help at all? Anything else? Yes. I'm, uh, I'm curious. You touched on uh, the presentation of a painting uh, through mats and framing. What's your professional take on covering, uh, uh, like a watercolor? What type of covering is good and what is bad? You mean to protect it? Yes. I'm, I'm talking about frosted glass, museum okay. glass, plexiglass, regular glass. Yeah, I mean, that gets a little bit technical. It really gets down to what you can afford. Again, if you go out to the museum, I keep harping on the museum because I love the museum, but if you go out to the museum, for example, I was looking today at a, a new uh, gift, I think, of a mother will. It's framed, it's framed with that, I call it German museum glass. I don't know technically called, but when you're up on it, you would swear that there's nothing covering it, and you, you almost wonder how could they possibly leave a large collage uncovered, except you know that's not true, and you go to a slight angle, and you can barely tell that it's covered. That glass is exceedingly expensive. Uh, as I like to say to people who buy my work, you know you're a collector when you pay more for the frame than you did for the piece. <laughs> Frosted glass, or what you call non glare glass, the problem with that is it's only good for one angle. You move a little bit and you lose a great deal. So if you can afford not to use that, I, I would suggest it. Uh, regular glass is really not all that bad, but you're going to get a reflection. And of course, there's a danger to it as well. If, you, if you're shipping your work, then you pretty much have to go over to plexiglass, which is, again, not ideal, but if you're dealing with a five-foot piece of work in the paper, uh, glass that you really have. Anything else? Well, I think we've probably exhausted your patience, and it's time to go and get some art.
So I went up to her present. When I call your name, please come on stage so you can be recognized. And after the other winners are announced, we'll take a photo. Then Marion will escort you and her to the gallery where we'll all join the artists who were juried into the show. And the beautiful Raleigh Fine Arts ladies with the aprons on will be very happy to take your checks or cash. <laughs> okay, the envelope, please. All right. For the jury, jurors. Oh. 